Hi, I'm Pete Meyer, technical editor of Motor Age magazine. You may recognize the car. It's been in a few of our other videos, and it's my personal ride, a 2007 Toyota Corolla. A few weeks ago, the check engine light came on. Diagnosing check engine lights is a common task for technicians in the shop, and codes related to the evaporative emission systems is a leading cause of check engine light complaints. So why don't we make that the topic of this month's The Trainer. You probably already have a clue as to what codes we'll be chasing today, but let's start by asking the computer to tell us why it turned the light on. I'm using an aftermarket PC-based scan tool to communicate with my Toyota, but any scan tool should be able to access the information using the global OBD2 mode. Most aftermarket scan tools also offer more specific OE information in what is called enhanced mode, so if you have that capability, so much the better. If I have the option, like I do with this tool, I'm going to ask all the modules I can how they're feeling to see if there are any other issues I or my customers should know about. Let's see what the Toyota has to tell us. There are two codes stored, and here we can see both the global OBD2, here called generic, information as well as the enhanced. Global is telling me it sees two faults. The first is a code P2610 related to the ECM itself, and the other is a P0456 an EVAP leak code. Enhanced, however, is showing just the 2610. The next step in any diagnostic process is to be sure you understand what the code you are troubleshooting means. How does the ECM know there's a problem? What kind of tests did it make before deciding to turn on the light? Under what conditions were those tests made? I also make a practice of checking for any related technical service bulletins. Many problems on later model vehicles are related to the computer's software requiring the module to be reprogrammed. If that's the case, I can spend hours looking for something I'm never going to find. In addition, I encourage the use of other information sources like the International Automotive Technicians Network and Identifix to see if other techs have had to deal with the same problem. Don't look for a silver bullet, but additional diagnostic direction. Always confirm the cause for yourself. Don't throw parts at a problem just because it worked for someone else. Here's what I've got on the P2610. The code is for a problem with an internal timer in the ECM. According to the service information, it is used to ensure the accuracy of the ECM's EVAP test by allowing time for the fuel in the tank to cool down and stabilize. It starts up after the key is turned off and counts down five hours. To see if the timer is okay, the ECM compares it to the CPU clock when the engine is running. If it doesn't, it flags this code. When a code sets in the ECM, the ECM stores information about the conditions the vehicle was under when the problem occurred. It's called freeze frame. Let's take a look at the stored freeze frame for the P2610. Freeze frame is a valuable bit of information when dealing with some codes, like misfire and fuel trim related problems, but not so much in this type of code. This is one of many that belong to what's called a non-continuous monitor, an ECM test that only runs once per drive cycle. In this case, the freeze frame is only telling me the conditions this test required to run, and that's something we already knew. The engine has to be running. Wonder if anyone else has had this problem? Looking up the problem in Identifix doesn't reveal any major issues with the Corolla, but several Matrix models have had some ECM issues. According to the code definition and testing instructions, it's either a glitch or an internal fault in the ECM I can't fix. Wonder what else we can find while we're here. Hey, found a recall on these ECMs for some failed solder joints on the circuit board. According to the recall bulletin, this can cause all sorts of issues. It tells me to check the production number of the ECM to see if it's covered. Well, if it is or it isn't, this Toyota only has 55,000 miles on it and it's an 07 model. So any issues with the ECM will still fall under the 880 emissions warranty. Time to take it to the dealer and have the ECM replaced. Robin, the slightest impact was sufficient 
to instantly reduce them to antimatter. Well, we've taken the car to the dealer and had the ECM replaced. Now let's talk about that lead coat. Before I sent the car to the dealer, I collected some more information. Notice the PID in the data stream, status of EVAP test 1. It reads, prohibited. Wonder why? Time to read up on how this system works. EVAP leak codes are probably in the top 10 of codes techs deal with. Finding the leak can pose a challenge, and so can verifying the repair. Many models have involved drive cycles that the ECM uses to completely test these systems, and it can literally take days, even weeks, for an ECM to complete those tests. More so than some others, it is imperative you know exactly how the system you're working on functions. While most of the basics are the same, how they work varies quite a bit. Let's start under the hood with the purge control valve, what Toyota calls the EVAP vacuum switching valve, or VSV. This valve is normally closed, with engine vacuum on one side and the other connected to the charcoal canister located under the car. The ECM turns the EVAP VSV on with a duty cycle signal to control how much purge flow is allowed. What's purge flow? That's taking the tank's fuel vapors, stored in the canister, and sending them through the engine to be burned, rather than released to the atmosphere. The rest of the system is under the car and consists of the charcoal canister, pump module, refueling valve, and the lines that connect it all together. The pump module itself houses the vacuum pump, canister vent valve, and a pressure sensor. The ECM tests the system by first waiting for the fuel in the tank to cool and stabilize. Remember the internal timer failure code? That's the timer that tells the ECM when it's okay to begin its test, and if it's broke, the EVAP monitor won't run. Matches the PID on the data stream, doesn't it? That puts the leak code stored in doubt, doesn't it? But let's check it out anyway. Back to the ECM's test. Once the timer has counted down five hours, the ECM checks the engine temperature. If that meets its spec, it begins the EVAP system test. The first thing it does is measure the system pressure with the canister vent open, or its normal state. It looks for the pressure in the system to be near atmospheric, and if it isn't, the test is suspended. Next, the ECM establishes a reference pressure by drawing a vacuum on the pump side of a small 20 thousandths of an inch orifice incorporated in the pump module. Then the system is closed by turning on the vent, the pump now draws a vacuum on the entire system, and that pressure is recorded for future comparison. The purge valve is then open, and the ECM looks for the corresponding increase in pressure. Last, another reference pressure is measured and compared to the recorded system pressure from before. If there is a significant difference, the ECM knows there is a big leak somewhere. If the variance is smaller, it's a small leak. The most common mistake when troubleshooting system leaks is playing with the gas cap. Sure, if the cap is loose or left off, the system will set a large leak code. Many newer systems can tell by the size of the leak that it is the gas cap and even light up a dedicated warning lamp for it. But if it's not obvious, leave the cap away you found it. The best way to check the system for leaks is with an EVAP system tester like this new Snap-on EELD500. This particular machine offers an automated test, remote control operation, and lots of other great features. Smoke machines like this one are also valuable in diagnosing lots of other issues like engine vacuum leaks, exhaust leaks, even wind leaks. For more information, check out the videos we have posted in the workshop. To perform the automated test with this machine, first access the test port usually located under the hood in the line leading from the purge valve to the canister. Remove the Schrader valve with the tool supplied and install the test fitting, then the hose from the machine. The default test size is 20 thousandths of an inch and is for use with cars made in the 2000 model year or later. And you can adjust this for older cars. Now we have to close off the system. The vent valve is a normally open solenoid. We either need to command it close with a scan tool or close off the fresh air line leading to it. The machine puts a smoke containing a UV dye into the system and can be used with shop air, CO2, or nitrogen, whichever may be specified by the OE test procedures. If a leak exists, look for the smoke and or the UV dye traces that you'll find at the leak source. Isolating the location of the leak can be helped by breaking the system into sections. I like isolating the purge side of the system from the canister side by disconnecting the purge line of the canister, then using the smoke machine to test just one side at a time. Don't forget to look for smoke along the tank filler tube and vent lines or from the top of the tank itself. 
I've had more than one leaking from a damaged fuel pump module seal. Many testers have a pressure function and a smoke function. On these, use the pressure function and save the smoke juice for later. On the front of these machines is a check ball and gauge meant to be used as an indicator of how big a leak is in the system. Personally, I've never used it for that specific purpose. Instead, I like to pressurize the system and look to see if the ball will make it all the way to the bottom. If there is little fuel in the tank, it can take a while to air up the entire system, so be patient. There is no question there's a leak if the ball never reaches the bottom, but there is still a question if it does and you can test for that simply enough. Once the check ball reaches the bottom of the gauge, stop adding air and wait 10 to 15 seconds. Then hit the switch again while watching the ball. If any pressure was lost, the ball will jump off its stop and drop down again. This indicates a small leak somewhere in the system that you'll need to track down. Hey, you just did your own automatic leak test. Here's a tip that may help you locate those small leaks. Use your mechanic's stethoscope without the tip or a piece of rubber hose as a sounding tube to listen for the hiss of the escaping air. Never use unregulated shop air to pressurize the system. These systems operate at very small pressures and you'll damage some expensive parts if you do. The successful completion of an evaporative emissions code is no different than any other. Know how the system functions, know what tests the ECM takes in order to set the code, use your service information to get the information you need to perform a professional diagnosis. Don't rely on silver bullets, don't immediately condemn the gas cap, or your customer will be back. That'll do it for this month's edition of The Trainer, I'm Pete Meyer. emissions and testing. That's part of the A8 ASE certification. If you're preparing for your ASE certification exams, check out Motor Age Training Study Guides. They're the only ones that come with a money-back guarantee if you don't pass. In addition, if you just want to sharpen up your skills on testing these different systems, they make great general study guides. So check them out at PassTheASE.com today.